It's almost there. Hi there, everyone. It's me, Richard Casey, VMG president, and uh, welcome to our first ever VMG live session. So um, today for me, I don't know about you, it is week number three of lockdown. Um, not starting to get carbon fever just yet, but um, certainly every day so far is really proven to be uncertain and changing every day. But However, with every change brings another opportunity and this is our first VMG live session and hopefully the first of many. Now, we intend these to be very topical and relevant to today. So today with me, I have personal gal pal and bereavement expert, Diane James from the Blue Cross. Welcome, Di. How are you? Thank you, President. Nice to see you, Mr. President. Nice to see you too. Where are you joining us from today? I am in sunny South Wales, not far from Cumbran. Mm -hmm. um, actually in my living room um, and in the household, we have two dogs, a husband and a daughter. And not in that order, I hasten to add. Not in that order. How long have you been living in, oh, you're originally from South Wales? No, I um, came to South Wales when I was nine. Uh, so I class myself as Wenglish because I was actually born in England, but I've been here for the majority of my life. I'm married to a Welshman, my daughter's Welsh, but I still support England at rugby, I'm sorry to say, Rich. Really? Mm-hmm. Mm. So um, let's not get into the, um, uh, the, um, the groping situation then. <laughs> uh, so tell us a little bit about you, Di, and your career backgrounds, you know, and what's brought, what brought you to Blue Cross? Um, I'll cut it quite short because I'm quite old, but I tend to have longevity in the jobs that I do. Um, mm -hmm. And going back to how I started working with animals, I started when pets at home were very small. I opened store 30 in Cumbran, mm -hmm. and I progressed with them to being part of the team when we did the buyout on Pet Smart. And when I left there, I was an area training manager covering from well, North Wales down to Cornwall. Um, loved it, but I then amazingly um, had a baby at the ripe old age of 35. Mm -hmm. um, and it's made me want to reassess my career. So I went into HR and training, did my CIPD, which I still keep at my membership of now. And whilst I was doing that, I discovered I enjoyed counselling. So I dropped a day a week, went back to uni, did my postgrad in counselling. Um, and then I looked after my dad for a bit before that. Uh, and when he died, sadly, I was working at a hospice, counselling people who were terminally ill, um, mm. children, adults, their families before, during and after. Um, I found that once I lost my dad, I still wanted to do work in the bereavement world. And amazingly, came across Pet Bereavement in Blue Cross. Been in six years, absolutely love it. And it's everything that I want it to be. Um, and no day is ever the same, strangely enough. Mm. Do you like that variety? I love it. Um, you know, I, I love opening up my emails and getting an email about something I never even thought of. Um, and, you know, we do a lot of research with unis. I never thought that we'd be involved with there. We do training in unis to vet nurses, vet, you know, fourth year veterinary students, um, talk at conferences, congresses, telly, radio. I never thought I'd sit on the sofa on this morning. Nobody ever thinks that. You know, and uh, I laugh when I see people I've met on telly and it's just a bit surreal, but that's yeah. the job, it's great. Yeah. Um, tell me more about the um, the studying and working um, at the same time. But I suppose for you, it was studying on one hand, working on the other hand, and then new family as well. So how did you balance those three? Oh, I have to be honest, I'm a bit of a workaholic. Um, my mum always used to say, you cut me open and I'd have Blue Cross all the way through me. Mm -hmm. um, and any job I ever do, I give my all to, sometimes to the detriment of my family, and I'll admit that. Um, and going back to uni then, I had to give a day up in work, otherwise I couldn't have fitted it all in, because the amount of work that it generated um, just from uni itself was huge. And I had to do really five days in four of my job mm -hmm. um, and, and still be a mum and a wife. I have to confess, when I'm a pretty poor 
mum and the wife. I'm sure they wouldn't say that. No, you know, Rich, I sent it to school once with her shoes on the wrong feet. <laughs> Was that on purpose, though? No. <laughs> um, so what would, um, if you were to give one tip to, you know, friends, colleagues, peers, about if we were interested in going into that, um, you know, um, doing an additional, returning to adult learning and so on. I'm coming out at the end of the, um, my finish, just about to finish my MBA. So I know um, what's worked for me, what hasn't. It'd be interesting to hear what your number one tip to be to balance the work and learn agenda. I have to be honest, probably the same tip as I use for homeworking is diarising things. I'm very much a list person. So, you know, and it doesn't become a list that you just carry over. It becomes a list of important things that I do. And I mm. would put into that the importance of making time for other things. So my family, you know, if, for example, when she was young, if I took her to a party, I would diarise. It sounds terrible, but having a lot of structure to what you do, uh, very similar to my working day now. I have structure. I even put in my breaks, etc. cetera. Sure. Now, I know you've been work home working for a long time. So for you this isn't all that different to your usual day um, homework and so on. But um, I think for those who may never have homeworked or not as um, for this longer period, they would um, tell us how you um, make homework and work for you. What, what works well? I totally get how they feel because when I first started homeworking, this is going to sound really odd. I even thought, do I have to ask if I need to go to the loo? <laughs> and I know it sounds dark, but I've never, or can I have a coffee at my desk? Mm -hmm. um, but again, the most important thing now, I've been doing it for years, is again, I put on my um, Outlook calendar, my appointments for the day, even if I'm ringing somebody, and I put in there my breaks. And at the moment, because everyone in my family's here, um, in the morning we have a coffee break, they know the time, they turn up at the door of the office with the two dogs, my husband, my daughter, and we sit there for 15 minutes and just chat and have a coffee. Mm -hmm. Lunch break, same again. Um, I like watching Doctors on my lunch. They don't because it's apparently an old person's film or series. But so now we switch the telly off and we actually are talking and making part of the, the working day, our breaks. So I would say to people, make sure you're standing up, walking around, a bit of fresh air, because we get so dragged into it. Um, but the biggest tip at the end of the working day is switch off that laptop, that computer, and, and just rest for the night. Don't think about it because it'll be there in the morning and you can just keep, I've done it before in the past. I could work for hours and hours because I'm doing something I love, but I need that time away from yeah. the working environment. Yeah. I know that's certainly something for me that I have struggled with over the years when I've home worked because, you know, five o'clock comes and then, you know, the emails stop coming in and then you think finally, oh, I've got like some, I'm not being interrupted to get something done now, but then I think that tip of slowing down now so you can go faster later on is something I try and keep at the forefront of my mind. And um, I don't know about you, but I religiously use my Outlook calendar. Yeah. So um, it's not just a way for me to keep track of meetings. If I'm, uh, if I'm doing a piece of work on Monday, then I put that in the calendar because then if people see it as being free, they're just gonna put meetings and so on in. So um, it's certainly something that I would recommend to anybody at home listening as well is really, like Di said, use lists and take that one step further perhaps by putting it into your outdoor calendar. So it's a reminder. And then people can clearly, you know, clearly see what you're up to then. And it gives that transparency and um, visibility to what you're doing at home. But anyway, we digress. We're here to talk about pet bereavement and human behavior bereavement to some extent as well, because I know you are an expert in both areas. Ooh, thank so, you. Uh, last year, uh, Blue Cross celebrated their 25th anniversary for their pet bereavement support service. And I know you have over 100 members in the team. So tell us a little bit more about pet bereavement. Well, uh, a lot of people think that we sat in an office answering the calls. We actually have all around the UK uh, over 100 people who man the service for us, all fully trained, all have experienced a loss, um, and they are absolutely amazing. We open every day of the year, 8.30 to 
And I got to say, I am biased, but I've never met a team of people like it. Never let us down. Mm-hmm. But what we do is we support, not counsel. And we have to make that clear to people because it's not a counselling service. Whilst a lot of the stuff that we train and they use are counselling based, we're there to support, signpost um, and listen um, by phone and by email. And we are actually an exclusive release on Richard's show, um, looking at web chat as well. We hope to sort of before the end of the year introduce that for, because technology is moving on. Mm-hmm. Um, the support we give is to every type of person, age group you can guess. We go from um, people who want to know how to tell their child that the pet's died to people who are very vulnerable at the lowest ebb in their life and can be suicidal. But I have to say the word bereavement is a word a lot of people just associate with death, Mm. but it's any type of loss. It can be lost, stolen, a need to rehome for any reason, pre-euthanasia, anything like that at all, we will speak to people. And not only clients, but it's also for teams and those who work in animal um, organisations, welfare backgrounds, because they can become just as attached to the people and the animals that they work with. Uh, last year, we actually responded to, and this isn't including the people who put down or don't get through, 14,206, how much more precise can I be, uh, emails and phone calls. Mm-hmm. And, and then that was a huge increase. Emails we're seeing grow year on year. Uh, the, last month, we had um, a drop because people, I think, thought the service was shut, but we're not. We're here, we're trading as normally, every day, 8.30 to 8.30, open every day. Um, same with emails. So, and literature as well. Um, all, all that's free to any organisation. At the minute, we're having trouble, obviously, posting it, so it's all online, and they can download it digitally if they need it. So, the, you know, you've said, you know, that, that's our, you know, one providing that really relevant and obviously needed support for many considering the volume of calls, emails and so on that you get in. But I'd like to know a little bit more around um, two bits that you've said. So one, the um, how people are getting in touch with you and then we'll come back to the the, the pet bereavement um, spectrum, I suppose, um, um, later. But... So you, you, you said you offer email and telephone support and then you're about to launch live chat as well online. So how are you finding pe- the, the trend in how people want to communicate with pet bereavement support services um, like 10 years ago versus now? Gosh, if you went back 10 years ago, it was more of a befriender service where they physically would phone a person in their house. Um, even going back six years, we probably only had 20 odd people that were were there and that's how it worked we started to introduce email and mm. i would say email has grown phenomenally because we put a landing platform on our website because people tend to be more technically minded age is irrelevant now every age mm. spectrum covers technology um i would say probably equal split between phone and email now um email they tend to be um a lot of people only will ring once or email once sometimes emailers can be um, ping back and forth more often than the phone can um, because sometimes people ring on anniversaries or if they're more um, needing more sort of care they'll they'll ring more often but definitely um, technology is moving and that's what made us look at web chat um, because again you know a, a lot of younger people tend to work that way so we wanted to cover every base mm-hmm. but they're coming to us as well at the moment because of the current climate um, it's more the concern about obviously social distancing, the way obviously where they go to the vets. Um, um, we're dealing with a lot of people who, like everybody, are scared of the unknown yeah. and a situation I think that they're not used to, the same as the people dealing with it. It's new to all of us. Um, they're finding it very difficult. And I have to say, what I'm anticipating, and I'm not a fool, you know, I can't see in the future, is we're going to get a lot of people who will have. Um, what we call complicated grief after this, whereby they didn't have the closure because they weren't there or didn't see or weren't part of the end of the pet's life. So I'm thinking it's the knock-on effect is going to be huge for both sides. Yeah. Um, do you have any views on different usage of your service based upon demographic? We, um, gosh, do you know something? Demographically, it tends to be Oh, anywhere. Um, I mean, emails, for example, we even get from all over the world because obviously technology spans that way. Um, I have an email volunteer who lives in France, someone who lives in Canada. 
so where we get time differences, mm -hmm. often, you know, we have to be aware of that. Um, demographically, no. I mean, because Scotland's quite a spread out area, it tends to be more sporadic because, again, it's a landmass. Same as the middle of Wales, there's, you know, mainly we don't get there. So we just tend to be inner areas. Um, London, South East, I would say we get a really good spread um, for phone and email. But, uh, you know, we're finding more email is coming in from America or Australia, India, places now, um, you know, where they're Googling and we come up. So, so, so coming on to, I suppose, then the, the, you know, the, the core at the heart of what you do and the actual loss or uh, coming or accepting that you know end of life may be almost there for that um for that pet and I'm, I'm keen to hear what your thoughts on today's current situation with COVID-19 is and you've alluded a little bit there to um when the client isn't able well, hasn't been there when that perhaps PTS or euthanasia has happened which is something that we're having to do at the moment and recommend because of social distancing etc and so on that the, the client isn't in the consult room when when that important and delicate time happens so um what you know from your perspective what do you think we could be doing as a sector to support not just well i suppose i start with the um the client the pet donor first and then come on to the team later on to be fair, they're um, really closely linked in the, in what can be done and, and what you are actually doing. The biggest thing, whether it be the situation we're in now or any time, is communication. Um, what we tend to find is, is no matter what the situation, whether it be human or animal, when you're giving us something that is a shock to the system, we tend to get what we call a heightened state of awareness. And we will only hear specific things and not remember everything you've said. So we often say things that are important need to be repeated and you would get them, you would make sure that you clarified it with the client so that they understood. What we're finding at the minute, through no fault of anyone's, if people are having to wear protective equipment, masks, etc., a lot of people, it's muffled. And it's going to be because, so we're just saying, make sure you're aware, if you can speak louder and clearer. Um, and it's, you know, it is difficult because it's a hot working environment. It's an unusual environment anyway that you're working in. Um, but we are getting back the people. They're scared, obviously, when they see what they see when they turn up. So mm -hmm. what we do say is, is when somebody rings, as much information as you can give them on what's going to happen, what they're going to see. Um, it's not such a shock to them because I don't think they appreciate what, you know, what has to happen. Yes. Yeah. Um, because so I can you're right, because I suppose as well that, you know, historically in day to day routine, the whole um, clinical lock of the masks, it's that, you know, like um, surgical masks and PPE and stuff is kept for behind the scenes. So the clients may not historically have been used to seeing that and so on, whereas suddenly it's been thrust into the waiting area and so on. So um, I, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't taken that factor into consideration. And, and, and you know, to be fair, you wouldn't, because when you're professional, you're doing a job um, and something, you, you know, you have to do because of what's happening in the world today. Um, we really care about getting the job right, forgetting these added things. Um, you know, it's, it's even like, for example, if people have to remain in the car, um, again, communicating with them. Um, and again, what we've, we say is that on the telephone often is the, the point whereby they'll be listening more and you can get it right. Mm -hmm. um, and preparing them and things like you know literature like I, I mean it's not a plug for, for my service in Blue Cross but the fact that if you can give them our details or you've got cards or you can download something to give them when they leave you they're not totally isolated because no. that's where we can back up um, and you know and what we're finding is is people just do you know they some people understand some people don't um, and they're feeling very alone very distressed um, and it is really, really sad. But I'll, at the same time, those of you out there who are doing this, ring us as well. You know, the support's there because as tough as it is, um, you know, we're quite happy to, to speak to you too. Um, if you, it's totally impartial, the service, totally in confidence. You know, it's, it's, it's confidential, should I say. Um, but it is getting it right sort of um, on the phone. And then when you, when you do meet them and you're face to face, um, understanding that only are they grieving now 
but they they just don't know what's going on and mm. it is sad yeah so tell us a little bit around then the support your team and um, blue cross can provide perhaps to practices clients and the um, the the veterinary industry really well i would say the past couple of years we've worked really hard to um get into the veterinary industry um, and at grassroots in the unis etc because we believe that training and preparing people for bereavement in their workplace and for, for clients is really important and uh, I've got to say I'm a bit biased but I think the veterinary world is doing a lot lot better than we are in our human world in the preparation and training and what we do in the practices um, mm. and I'm really proud of a lot of people whereby we've gone in they we do an e-learning course it's accredited um, you know, they then become pet bereavement advisors and we're there to work with them. Mm -hmm. um, we do a shorter course for receptionists so that we can help people um, by doing face to face consultations with them. We do bespoke training um, and we actually even go into places and talk to them about how they can make they, they're putting rooms aside to make them specific for bereavement or for people that, you know, are going through the animal is terminally ill and they need space. Um, and it's amazing, you know, purpose built rooms and everything. I just mm -hmm. think that the veterinary industry is eons ahead of human. Um, I know that, for example, it's not a good good example. This when my dad died, the only place we could go and sit afterwards was Costa Coffee in the host, you know, in the hospital there. Um, whereas I could go to my vets and I'd have a specific area. They give mm -hmm. me time. Um, so I think you know we're we're way ahead in in what we do. Um, as well as that, I alluded earlier to um, we, we partake in research as well. So um, like you, I should have been at the BSAVA. Um, yesterday was, um, I was supposed to be doing three back-to-back -back talks on pet bereavement, human companion animal bond, because we get um, a lot of stats and information from what we do. Mm. Um, we work with quite a few different unis around the country. We go in, um, you know, Lincoln, we lecture to their animal behaviour master's course, um, Harper Adams. We, I work with um, Durham, Exeter as well. We're doing research on children and pet loss, how it affects them. Um, and a new one, and I'm, I don't know if I should allow to say it really, we, we're looking at COVID and how it's affecting the animal um, and owner relationship, what it's done as in obviously through uh, euthanasia. So yeah. it's, uh, but that's hot off the press, not even started yet. Hey, just, you for you. That. just for you, Rich. <laughs> so, I'm also keen to get your, you know, because obviously you've worked with us. Well, you've worked in, I suppose, the veterinary sector in a different a number of different ways. So there's the years you've been with Blue Cross and Pet Bereavement, but also then in previously, you know, you were at uh, Pets at Home. Is yeah, that... I had one of the first vets um, surgeries in my store from Companion Care in Pets at Home. Ah, so, you know, tell us, that, tell us then about um, what you think are the hot topics and trends that our industry should be taking and you're know, sitting up and listening and taking really seriously and I'd be really keen to know about the trends specific to the veterinary industry but what you think is happening in the world around us that we should also be taking account of. Gosh you threw that question in. <laughs> that wasn't on my pre-read. No um, I honestly think that the most important things about what's going on in the world Obviously, number one for me, because it's close to my heart, is how we work with people, um, you know, with social distancing and the practices that are going to come in because of social distancing, whether the animal be going through an emergency op or whether it be being um, euthanized, I think is vital. But I also think, and this is a big one close to my heart, the welfare of the people who are actually working in that environment. Um, it's tough. And I, th I sometimes think people forget that long hours. Um, and the job itself and, and emotional support for them because compassion fatigue is massive. Um, you know, and I know in the veterinary industry, there's some good backups out there, but I also sometimes think that in a lot of places, um, we think we talk the talk and we don't. And it's important that we get that right. Yeah. So I'd say that. And another biggie for me is um, out there working in a charity, we are seeing how desperately people are trying to feed themselves never mind their animals and care for their animals. Um, we're doing as much as we can. I know other animal charities are, but like everyone else, um, you know, it's a massive loss to us at the moment because we can't function as we normally would. Awesome. Um, and yet people need us. 
Fab. Thank you. Thank you, Diane, for joining us today. I know it's um, a time out of your diary. We really appreciate it. You know, I made some notes as we were going through and I'm trying to summarise like what your key points were. But I think for me, the big golden nuggets were that we can really take away an action right now as a sector is like, you know, when we're having those triage phone calls and inviting people in where we think it may be a potential you know, euthanasia situation is to really ex take the time there to explain what's going to happen what they may expect when they arrive at the practice. It's not going to look or feel like it usually does. Um, so the importance of slowing down to get that right can really have the, all the benefit later on for the client, the team and um, the family at home too. Not forgetting to signpost to bereavement support, whether that is ourselves or any other bereavement support that, we, that is out there, but ultimately as well, that bereavement support and compassion fatigue is there for the team as well as the as much as the pet owner. Thank you, Di. Rich, um, I just, can I interrupt really quick because I forget a vital thing I forgot. Okay. We, are, we have actually produced as a service um, a telephone support and a face-to-face -face support, um, like a crib sheet um, that we sent out to quite a few vets, veterinary organisations. Mm -hmm. So if anyone wants it um, and they get to you and I can send it to you, we're updating it as the situation changes. So next week it will probably be more different. Okay, well, um, we'll pick up off air. We can get that certainly added to our website immediately as um, you know an additional resource available right now. But um, thank you very much, Di. Stay safe and to everyone at home, have a fantastic weekend. Join us next week for our next VMG live event where we're going to be joined by Becky Armstrong from Sparkle People and Develop and we're going to be talking about how you can stay connected at a distance. So have a great weekend guys, take care. Bye. Bye-bye.